Millions of travelers from all over the world come to Egypt each year to see the pyramids at Giza. Towering above the horizon, these megalithic marvels evoke awe and wonder. But beneath the sand of the Giza Plateau is where we find some of Egypt's most intriguing mysteries. And yet, most people who travel to Egypt never even get to see such unusual accomplishment. But the fact remains, numerous archaeological features still exist below the sands of the Giza Plateau, hidden just beneath the surface and out of plain sight. The so-called Tomb of Osiris, more commonly known today as the Osiris Shaft, is among these marvels. And it may even be older than the pyramids themselves, as I will cover in this video, so you'll definitely want to stick around to the end. Unfortunately, there is an abundance of misinformation out there on the internet, and that is where this ultimate guide to the Osiris Shaft comes in handy. I've invested what felt like endless hours in libraries like this one at the Theban Mapping Project in the West Bank of Luxor on a quest in search of answers. I've lost entire weekends to scouring through technical jargon and journals and long boring academic papers. I put the work in so that you don't have to. But as always, I still encourage you to do your own research to verify what's being said for yourself. One of the other problems is that the Osiris Shaft is not easily accessible. It's not open to the general public for exploration. It requires a high-priced special permissions permit, which has to be booked in advance. The cost is best absorbed across a group tour, like the group tours that I lead through Egypt that you can join by registering at adeptexpeditions.com. But if you can't make it out to Egypt for a tour, you can still benefit from this ultimate guide to the Osiris Shaft. In this video, I'm going to take you on a journey through the alleged tomb of Osiris, shaft by shaft, chamber by chamber, niche by niche, with up-to-date information to shed light on this subterranean monument that for ages has been shrouded in mystery. Mysteries that I will be revealing for you as we take a deep dive into the Osiris Shaft. But first, I'd love for you to click the subscribe button if you are new here, and be sure to also click the bell icon to receive notifications when I drop new videos like this one. It's just before 5 a.m. and we are in Giza boarding the bus, I'm leading another one of my tours through Egypt, and I'm excited. I'm excited because it's my first time exploring the Osiris Shaft. What's up everybody? We're here before opening at the Giza Plateau. You can see the pyramids in the background here. And we're on our way to go inside the Osiris Shaft. About 2,500 years ago, the Greek historian Herodotus, who I guess you could call the world's first foreign correspondent, visited this site. Local villagers and guides told him that he could find the tomb of a king buried deep beneath the Giza Plateau. Well, about a year ago, Dr. Zahi Hawass, who joins me here at the mouth of the shaft, embarked on what he calls his greatest adventure ever. Zahi, you've been doing this for some 30 years. Why is this so amazing? Uh, you know, Susie, it's amazing because this is the first time that they excavate underneath 100 feet in water. Before, I excavate on sand and dirt. And also, at the same time, I discovered that this is what Herodotus talked about. And they found that this is the tomb of Osiris. This is a map of the Giza Plateau. It was drawn by engineer John Shea Perry in 1837 for Major Colonel Sir Richard William Howard Weiss, a British military officer in the Queen's Army. This is Giovanni Battista Caviglia, an Italian sea merchant who was digging at the pyramids. Weiss offered to be his financial backer, providing Weiss was credited as co-discoverer, but Caviglia refused. Weiss left Egypt for a few months, but he must have either been bitten by the Egypt bug or develop a case of discovery fever that was going around in his day, because he returned with what seemed like an obsession to find something significant. Even in his journal, he admitted his strong desire to make a discovery before returning to England. He just couldn't go back home empty-handed. He managed to score a permit and worked his way in with Cavillia. His journals also account for having paid Cavillia $200 as an advance payment before leaving Egypt for a sightseeing tour. Upon returning to Giza, 
The only thing he discovered was that Cavilia had discovered a new tomb in his absence, but named it Campbell's Tomb after Colonel Campbell, while he and his workmen were out digging for mummies, which were all the rage in those days as they were fetching top dollar from museums and private collectors. The two eventually fell out and had a violent argument. Cavilia was discharged from his work the following day and banned from the site by Vice. Even though his journal credits Cavilia for the work, Vice took all the credit for Cavilia's discovery. Vice and Perry would continue excavating Giza in a very crude and invasive way using gunpowder and explosives. Though their methods were controversial, they still managed to meticulously document their findings every step of the way. Pering was sure to adequately document the location of the shaft on this map of Giza as shaft number one. As I push in with a close-up, you can see here how the Sphinx is facing east. East is oriented at the top of this map. Right here, in between the Sphinx and the Khafra Valley Temple, is where you find shaft one. This turned out to be the first known map to show the entrance to what is now known as the Osiris Shaft. It wasn't until a hundred years later that Egyptian Egyptologist Dr. Salim Hassan would provide further documentation during his systematic excavation in the 1930s. The excavation report describes finding the subway and the Khafra's causeway in the sixth season of his work. They were able to get partway down the shaft complex but found the remainder flooded. Hassan stated, and I quote, We tried in vain to pump out the water, but it seemed that a spring must have broken through the rock, for a continual daily pumping over a period of four years was unable to reduce the water level. End quote. In 1945, Abdel Monim Abu Bakr learned that the shaft and its attached chambers were not only positioned under the causeway of Kafra, but also that it provided a source of drinking water for the Giza Plateau for locals for many years. He also discovered that locals from the nearby village would swim in the shaft when the rising water table flooded the complex. So the claim made by some researchers that the Osiris shaft hasn't been opened or touched by the public for hundreds of years is not true. The shaft also continued to provide a summer swimming hole for guides at the Giza Plateau, and workmen responsible for the rest house of Cairo University, located south of the Khafra Causeway, used the shaft as a water source running a pipeline from the shaft to the rest house. In 1980, American archaeologist Mark Lehner used the shaft to gauge the depth of the water table, and his report also confirmed the chambers contained bones. Now we have identified these bones as part of one of my recent Adept Expeditions tours, and I have published the results in a video that you can watch here on this channel. I was also told by my dear friend and mentor, the late great symbolist author John Anthony West, that his former business partner had stumbled upon the shaft back in the 1990s. Boris Said was an ex-captain of the US Olympic bobsled team and the producer for Mystery of the Sphinx, the documentary film that made West's water erosion theory famous. Said explored the shaft several times during the 1990s. His team scraped away the dirt on the floor of the lower level to clear a level area for their camera tripod. To their surprise, they uncovered a complete sarcophagus lid. Suspecting that it may lead to a secret tunnel, they decided to investigate further using ground-penetrating radar. Below the lid, they detected a two and a half meter wide anomaly with what looked like a dome ceiling. This anomaly descended at a 25 degree angle and headed in the direction of the Sphinx, 275 yards away. Boris wanted his partner at the time to ask Dr. Zahi Hawass to investigate further by digging a hole to enter the tunnel. But a dispute over permits led to dissolving the partnership and turning off the Egyptian authorities. However, there can be little doubt that Boris Said played an instrumental role in raising consciousness around what would soon become known as the Tomb of Osiris. The first important about the shaft that it is uh, the shaft that we're going to talk about, but no one even know about it until I excavated it, I took the water, and I found the sarcophagus. 
And contrary to what the fabricated Fox News special wants us to believe, that we are watching a new discovery, it wasn't actually discovered by Zahi Hawass, nor was it discovered by Boris Saeed. It wasn't Abu Bakr or Salim Hassan or even Howard Weiss who discovered the Osiris Shaft. It was Giovanni Battista Caviglia nearly 200 years ago. And now we are going to enter today. And I'm excited because it's my first time exploring the Osiris Shaft. Getting access to the Osiris Shaft isn't easy. It's forbidden to the general public and requires a costly permit to enter. And we were told that there would be no light. No light inside. Okay. No light? No light. No light. on. Have flashlight. Yeah. For the money you pay to enter, you would think they would have a better lighting set up and perhaps pick up some of the trash that has blown inside. But as with many sites in Egypt, that's just not the case. I struggled to kick some of the plastic bags off the ladder, making it safe for climbing. In hindsight, I should have brought some of my own plastic bags to pick up some of this garbage. But our special permissions permit only allows for a limited time and we have much work to do. All right, down into the Osiris shaft we go. The first level is reached via this 9 meter vertical shaft, cut through the causeway and down through the roof, and then this floor of the subway passing beneath it. It's now accessible via this iron ladder. The first level opens up to an empty space, not much to see here besides some trash on the ground. Beneath the earth, you can feel the dust in the air and the temperature here is much warmer with little ventilation from the exterior surface above. The entrance to the second tier, or middle level, is through an opening cut in the north wall of this shaft, which you can see here. So we're now inside the Osiris shaft. We've descended the first level here. We're just waiting for the rest of the group to come down. As you can see, there's some sand falling as people come down. We're now going to go down to the second level. Cut into the floor at the right. northern end is another shaft. One of these is more sturdy than the other, I think. Was it this one? Yeah, don't use this one. <laughs> okay, this is the, whoa. <laughs> this one goes way down there. This one is more intimidating. You have a choice of two ladders, with the one to our right being more sturdy. But you still have to proceed with caution as you continue descending 14 meters into the rock before reaching the second level, where again, light was limited to our flashlights. We were joined by a mouse who showed us the way from the south side of this large chamber to the sub side chambers. So we are now down here, the second level of the Osiris shaft. You can see it looks like there would have been one box here that is now missing perhaps you will find three chambers cut into the west wall on your left and three into the east wall to your right and one alcove cut into the north wall we'll first take a look here in chamber c you can see tool marks on the wall a granite sarcophagus was discovered set into this pit that had been cut into the floor Inside the sarcophagus, Egyptologists found badly decayed remains of a skeleton, along with the remains of shoptis and pottery shards from the 26th dynasty. And the shape of the sarcophagus also dates it to the 26th dynasty. Moving along, one meter north is chamber D. Here we see a monolithic sarcophagus, also in the style of the 26th dynasty, and probably weighs about 40 tons. Stuffed between the sarcophagus and the south wall, Egyptologists discovered a large number of shoptis and pottery shards, all dating to the 26th dynasty. You also see this mysterious black goo. Geologists take a look at this. Appears to be some sort of residue or moisture. This is but one of many mind-boggling enigmas that shroud this box in mystery. As you examine the sarcophagus, several questions will come to mind, such as what type of stone is it? Where did it come from? And how was it shaped? How was the monolith moved down the shaft and then brought into this niche? And what is this sticky residue or mysterious black goo that we see on the box? And why is it on the ceiling? What exactly happened here? The sarcophagus calls to my mind the enormous Apis bull burial boxes that we find in the Serapium at Saqqara. Dr. Salim Hassan was under the same impression. In his 1934 excavation report, he writes, and I quote, Two of these sarcophagi, which are of basalt and are monolithic, are so enormous that at first we wondered if they contained the bodies of sacred bulls. 
end quote. And Dr. Zahi Hawass, who excavated this chamber in 1998, also describes the box as being a basalt sarcophagus. Looking at the accounts of these two primary sources in Egyptology should answer our first question, what kind of stone is it? However, researcher Robert Temple investigated the Osiris shaft after Zahi, and although he couldn't get a sample for x-ray diffraction analysis, he felt that the stone doesn't appear to be basalt. He supposes some type of black granite, but neither the Egyptologists nor Robert Temple are geologists. So where do we turn? Admittedly, I'm not a qualified geologist either, but we happen to have one on board in our Adept Expeditions tour party. So I asked so her- this residue, what do you suspect this is? After spending some time examining the stone, our geologist determined that it was a fine sandstone saturated with oil, hydrocarbon. Now, if it is basalt, it would be no question where the stone came from, as we have matched the quarries in the Fayum to the basalt stone that we find at Giza, east of the Khufu Pyramid. But I'm not so sure that's the case. I think the Egyptologists may be wrong, and I will lean on the authority of our geologists. What about this up here? What would cause this to the stone? So then, if it is sandstone, it's either naturally occurring and next, we would have to investigate where the outcrops of sandstone with hydrocarbon would be located. But if it's not naturally occurring, we have to consider the possibility that it was applied. Either by accident that took place when Hassan and later Hawass pumped water from the lower level, as we can see the iron pump from Hassan's day still down here. Or perhaps the ancient Egyptians applied the goo with intention. But if so, why? We'll come back to that later. To sufficiently explain how the stone was shaped, it would require more time than we have allotted for this video. So, for the sake of brevity, I will recommend checking out YouTube channels who specialize in exploring the questions of how hard stone was fashioned in ancient times with primitive techniques. Two such channels that are demonstrating this are Sacred Geometry Decoded and Science Against Myth. I would also recommend watching my ultimate guide to the Serapium video for a detailed explanation of how the monolithic granite boxes in the Serapium were moved. It's reasonable to conjecture that the same method would be applied here, likely using sand hydraulics to lower the box inside the shaft, and then wooden rollers with a wooden winch and ropes to move the boxes into each niche. And uh, how do you suppose they actually got the boxes down here? I know not really your specialty, but what do you think? Our open-minded electrician, what's your take? I'm not too sure, honestly. I don't know what to make of it, but sand hydraulics would be the most logical thing, yeah. I would say and it would definitely fit down that shaft. Sand hydraulics through here? You guys think it may be multiple trips? Another tunnel? Yeah. I mean, do you think it could, if it came down vertically, it should be able to fit, unless this has been widened over time. If it was lowered vertically using sand hydraulics, taking sand out, yeah. allowing it to slowly come down, we could probably fit that through here. Yeah, if somebody had a tape measure, yeah. you could check the dimensions. Yeah. See if it's, we don't we don't know how much over time this has been widened either. Right. So would they have room for a person yeah. beside it taking the sand out? Right. Uh, uh, or even buckets and right. You know, yeah. Hoisting yeah. a bucket up. Um, That's about six feet. They could stack two coffins. And yeah, you could do two times. Or you could, you know, you could fill it twice. Fill it twice. Once yeah. again. I think I think it, it would, would fit. fit. It would fit in terms of measurement. So it definitely fit. Yeah. 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 So that's reasonable. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sand hydraulics, yeah, maybe. Maybe. I don't, yeah. And then you just move it into yeah, this hole. Is a very difficult question. Perhaps the most intriguing mysteries are the questions we have about this elusive Ooh, substance. This isn't entirely covered. Is this entirely covered in this substance? No, right? It seems to be seeping more and more, <coughs> more in the front. Certain points. Higher concentration the, right here. Yeah, and the deal is a lot of this is covered by sand on the top. I don't know why it seeps more over here, but like right here where it's covered with sand, you can still feel it once you wipe the sand off. We know that it's some sort of black goo, but why do you suppose it was used? I first asked some members of our expedition party about the goo. So what's your final take, Michael? What do you think? I think that they knew that this, this stone holds oil. And for some reason that was special to them. Stephen Tasker says he believes that they were moving things using oil. And I asked him the first time I met him about it. I said, seed oil, 
because that's I thought our, our our animal oil or petroleum oil. And he said at the time he thought it was cattle oil rendered lard. But I think they they were geologists. I read that in Chris Dunn's book. He thinks they're geologists. I think they knew exactly what these stones were, and this was special to them. And I'm going to go completely speculative for a second. This is the tomb of Osiris, right? Supposedly, conceptually. Right. So did he have any relationship to like dark, um, kind of mysterious fluid? Well, it turns out Michael may be on track with his symbolic interpretation linking Osiris. Osiris was associated with death and rebirth, and funerary texts refer to him as the Black One. He is often depicted with black skin in the guise of a mummified body. Black is also the color associated with the rich alluvial silt deposited along the banks of the River Nile after the annual flood receded. Hence, the ancient name for Egypt, Kemet, which meant the Black Land. Since the rich, fertile soil provided the ideal environment in which seeds for crops could germinate and grow, it was viewed as being inherently magical and regenerative. So, we have interlinking concepts of black, Osiris, and regeneration. It could therefore be reasoned that the practice of coating coffins in black goo links the coffins to regeneration associated with Osiris. But what is it? We examined it and noticed that it wasn't water. It was sticky to touch. And it smelt like petroleum, leading us to suspect some sort of bitumen. So I did further research and discovered a recent study published by the British Museum in May of 2020. Experts analyzed more than 100 samples of black goo from 12 coffins and mummy cases, and they discovered that the goo is made of a combination of plant oil, animal fat, tree resin, beeswax, and bitumen, as we suspected, which is solid crude oil. The exact ingredients vary from one coffin to the next, but the goo was always made from some of these ingredients. If you'd like to learn more about this recent study and its results, I have a video here on my YouTube channel that goes into more detail. I will leave a link down below. So this should solve the mystery for you, but before we move along, let's take a look at this beautiful iron vein running throughout the west side subchambers. This is the rest of the, this is the rest of the iron. Vein. I think it's iron because of the color, and, and I think yeah, I do too. You're saying the same. So the bright color, vein, complete vein, running all the way through. And then you'll see it on the other side over here. It continues right there, and runs all the way over here, and seems to truncate right there. Moving along, we now come to chamber E. This chamber is located just shy of a meter north of chamber D. On the north side of the floor from the northern wall is a small rectangular pit carved into the living rock with no artifacts discovered in this chamber. Moving north, we reach chamber F. I don't know, and here you have pottery. These are the pottery shards. This is chamber F. It was cut directly from the north wall of the main chamber B. Here, no artifacts presented themselves during the Hawass excavation in 1998. But today, we can find a curious hodgepodge of 26 dynasty pottery shards and bones that since Mark Lehner's visit in the 1980s have been identified as human remains. It's likely these bones have been moved out of situ as Hawass reports the remains of human bones found near the sarcophagus in chamber G, that is, the next chamber to our right with the sarcophagus in it that we'll see in just a moment. He describes them as being dated to the late period. During this visit, we took a closer look. Hey, Aaron, look at this. It's a full on talus. Like, this is a distal radius, so it goes like that. Oh, the bones? Uh huh. Yep. This is a humeral head. head Wait. Our adept expedition's tour party included an orthopedic surgeon who was able to analyze the osteology in the Osiris shaft. The doctor was able to identify specific bones and reconstruct parts of the skeleton. Reconstructing the skeleton. We should have a full-blown human anatomy, full skeletal structure. So we have a doctor on board today. Yes. V, what are we looking at, V? This is the distal radius, so this would be this bone here, just like that. 
And then this is the humeral head. So go on your shoulder here. This Where? Is in your shoulder like that. Yeah. Actually, this is this is actually not the humeral head. This is the femoral head. It goes in the hip because you can see this little divot called the fovea. And this, the, these this are the certainly, are these human or could this these potentially are, be an animal? No, this is definitely all human. This is all human Yeah, this remains. is the humeral head here and it goes in your shoulder like that. Okay. And then these are skull bones. Wow. That's and, skull? Yep, yeah, and this is a finger. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. You the finger yet? Yes. <laughs> and the rest of this is all pottery. This was probably likely inside the pottery at some point. Yes. But it's amazing how crushed up it is. It is so many pieces. No. That's hard to say. But I just can't believe this whole bone is intact. My foot and ankle partner would be going crazy. Look at this. Full on tailless. See that it's joint service? Yeah. What's he suffering for arthritis? <laughs> Not on the ankle. This is pristine. Hey, look at this. Here, what do we have? That's a, um, amazing. Second vertebrae. And so the head rotates along here. There's one bone on top of that, and then it rotates like this. Like, wow. Where, well, this doesn't rotate, the head rotates on it. What else have you collected in our absence? Wow, we have quite a collection yeah. here. This is um, a humeral head, but you can see arthritic changes right through here, all the way down to the bone. We have another vertebrae here. This is the spinal canal there. We got th these two fingers. We, we made a full on finger here, finger joint here. And we come together. Trout can archer, death. This is another, um, this may be, no. The skull. Oh yeah, and the skull. Look at this suture, the suture line on the skull. Oh wow. So that's where it interdigitates to another bone, to another skull fragment like that. Wow. Results of this preliminary study reveal something peculiar. First of all, we discovered that the remains of at least three humans can be accounted for between the piles of remains in Chamber F and Chamber C. We documented our finds here on my YouTube channel, which was the first time this information revealed in this new study was published. I'll leave a link in the description down below. This is amazing. This is diseased. This is diseased. As you can see, the actual head, this is intact. Yeah, you can see the difference between the two. Mm -hmm. What sort of disease, do you have any idea? It could be arthritis, or it could be an injury to it, or it could be, it could be some other bone lesion. But yeah, the cartilage is damaged. And then these are vertebrae, we'll put the two vertebrae together. Yeah, that's the skull. These are finger bones. Sorry to this, but do you know the explanation of that being last? No, no, it's just uh, what it turns. So, from the skeleton. So, starting from the head down, that's the neck. So, where's the neck? So, the neck is right around here. That's a neck bone there. Yep. This is probably lower lumbar spine. And then these would be the humeral heads. This would be a humeral shaft. No, nah, that's not humeral shaft. That's there's no there's no line like that. So it's not the humeral that's shaft. That's not the humeral shaft. Okay. Uh, and then you go down. This is probably femur. This is definitely femoral head. And then it goes down. This may be the distal femur. And this may be the tibial, uh, proximal tibia. So your knee bone, like right here, your knee joint, and that's like their tibial tubercle. And then this is the foot and ankle stuff down below here. And so based on your assessment, we can it's safe to say there's at least two, two. people here, at yeah. least two, if two not people. more. Two people, because this is the same wrist, two different sizes, and one is smaller and one is bigger. And so it's the same, it's the same right wrist though. I can tell that this is a right wrist. So it'd be like that. Right. Amazing. Yeah, wow. For the other, what do we have? What else? This would be the ankles, the ankle bone, ankle, foot and ankle bones. How about that? These are foot and ankle bones. So, tailless, probably a tailless as well. 
And then this is the wrist. And that's the femoral head and the hip. hip bone. We're now going to move from chamber F across level two over to take a look at the bones in chamber C. This is metal. Oh, yeah. This is the vertebrae. It's a vertebrae? Uh -huh. Did we find a vertebrae on the other side? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Just one though, right? Yeah. With two of them. Two of two vertebrae. So now oh this. Oh my gosh, look at that. That's an ulna. That's what amazing. Is this? this is ulna. This is the, uh, it goes like this. Oh wow. So now we can confirm there's at least three people down here. Yeah. That's how that stacks. Oops, look at this. That's the spinal column is coming together. It is. Amazing. I would rather just raise. They're all right sides. It's weird. They're all right side. Yeah. But the fact that we discovered three right wrists and three right elbow joints is unusual. And it's statistically odd not to find any left pieces, which begs the question, why the right side? From a symbolist perspective, there could be a deeper, more symbolic meaning, especially when we consider how the ancient Egyptians treated the left side of the body. During the mummification process, the ancient Egyptians would make a cut on the left side of the body, near the stomach, to remove all internal organs. The only organ that they didn't remove was the heart. Ancient Egyptian statues, such as these striding colossi that we see here, are depicted as leading with the left foot forward, symbolically taking the first step, humanity's role in the grand cosmological scheme. For the ancient Egyptians viewed the heart, located on the left side of the body, as the seat of consciousness. Therefore, it's reasonable to conjecture that there may be something more to the right side, the active side. Moving along, we come to chamber G. Cut into the east wall of chamber B, this chamber contains another sarcophagus, rectangular in shape yeah. with a curved front, which fills it completely and extends into the rock chamber. We estimate its weight to be 40 tons. Remains of human bones, shabtis of blue faience, and pottery shards were found not in, but near the sarcophagus, and they date to the late period. The excavation reports of both Hassan and Hawass describe the sarcophagus as basalt. But as you will see in a moment, like the composition of the other box in chamber D, we don't think what it's about basalt. this one? Is this, a this is a different stone. This sarcophagus represents one of the strangest objects to survive from ancient Egypt. But without the appropriate context, given to you in this ultimate guide to the Osiris shaft, you wouldn't even know it. It appears to be an ordinary stone. You can see where the front left corner of the sarcophagus is broken. Cracks do occur naturally in rocks, but you wouldn't use a cracked block to cut a sarcophagus out, so indeed this is not natural. It's possible that it could have been a weak spot in the rock that cracked when forces were applied. Perhaps it fell down or something happened during transport into the shaft, but it's more likely to be from someone, perhaps tomb robbers, from an unknown time who tried to force their way in by breaking the sarcophagus. We do know that Cavelia was in the area during his mummy hunt, and Vice, who took this discovery from Cavelia, was known for using explosives. While we can consider both of these men suspects, it's important to note how the Osiris Shaft has a long, clouded history that went unreported, spanning a century before the time of Salim Hassan's first systematic excavation. All we can do is suppose that it was broken by a tomb robber in some unknown time long ago, but fortunately, the destruction offered an opportunity. Researchers Robert Temple and Ionis Loritzis obtained a small sample from the existing break made in antiquity. Their study yielded astonishing results. By means of X-ray diffraction analysis, they determined the stone is dacite. But as usual, the more questions we ask, the more answers we get. And the more answers we get, the more that new questions evolve. There are no dacite objects in the archaeological record used at any time throughout Egyptian history. So why dacite and why here? And according to Temple's geologist, there are no known veins of dacite in Egypt 
or even on the entire continent of Africa for that matter, able to produce a stone of this size. If the stone is indeed dacite, and there are no capable dacite deposits on this continent, this would mean that the enormous stone, weighing some 40 tons, would have to have been imported from outside of Egypt, foreign dacite. But we also find more of the same sticky black goo as the other stone, and Hassan and Hawass both describe this stone as basalt. I wanted another opinion, so I asked our geologist. She examined the stone and said that if it came down between basalt and dacite, she would say that it's dacite, because she could feel small grains on the rock surface, and with basalt, one would not expect that. However, her experience is more on sedimentary rocks than it is on volcanic rocks, so in the interest of fairness, she may not have the best eyes for determination of the rock type, if indeed volcanic. The grains and condensed appearance made her think of a compact siltstone instead of volcanic, but she was not certain. Dacite is usually relatively light in color, but the dark color can come from hydrocarbon saturation. Let's take a closer look. You don't see crystals, you see grains. You can see the way it's flaking off. Kind of a shell type of fracture, but it was quite hard, not like a shell, more like a mudstone. And when you rub your fingers on it, you can feel that it's a very fine sandstone with oil in it, just like the other stone in chamber D. It feels like a very fine sandstone, as you can feel the grains when you rub it. This indicates that it's not igneous rock, like granite. Our geologist concluded that it looks like sandstone, but looking at the grain size, it appears to be a fine sandstone. The color of it looks like the other one. It reminded our geologist of oil-saturated sandstone that she's seen before, hydrocarbon-saturated. Now, knowing that the ancient Egyptians intentionally applied bitumen, we suspect that this is a sandstone coffin that was submerged with the ancient Egyptian hydrocarbon. Temple's physicists used thermal fluorescence to determine an age and received a range between 3350 to 2250 BC. But this is a controversial method not universally accepted. Zahi Hawass dates this chamber to the late Syed period, an extension that would have been cut into the rock after the chamber below, which he dates to the New Kingdom, even though Old Kingdom artifacts have been discovered down there. Let's move along to the next chamber. Chamber H is the last chamber, and it's located about one meter south of Chamber G, and it does not contain any archaeological evidence, but still has this iron wheel from the time of Hassan's attempt to pump out the water back in the 1930s. It's almost 100 years old, and one wonders if future archaeologists looking back at this will see an out-of-place artifact, perhaps their version of a schist disk. We now move over to the next okay, chamber. Clear. Before you make your descent down this shaft, you will notice a rectangular niche cut into the rock, which is similar in size and shape to the burial chambers here on this level. That's why I referred to it as a chamber when we first entered. There are seven rectangular niches carved into the walls before the descent down shaft C. Four large ones, two each in the northeast and southwest walls, and three small, one in the northeast and two in the southeast walls. These might have been used for lowering the large sarcophagus down the shaft by using wooden beams. And we can find more of the parallel tool marks in this shaft leading down to the third level. This floor plan provides us with an overview of what level 2 looks like today. However, in the early 90s, when Boris Said first explored the Osiris shaft, it would have looked like this. As he claims that the rest of level 2 was inaccessible. He couldn't see it. He never made his way into the subchambers. Now, it's likely that they were concealed with sand or debris, perhaps after the time of Mark Lehner's visit in the 80s, maybe to preserve the site. But whatever the case, this is how it would have looked at its earliest inception if we subscribe to Zahi's idea that level 2 is a late Syed period extension to the tomb of Osiris down below. Dr. Zahi Hawass believes that this is the legendary chamber talked about by Herodotus, who relates how he was told there exists underground sepulchral chambers on the hill where the pyramids stand, and how a cut was made from the Nile so that Nile water turned the site into an island. But why was this excavation of the chamber so important? The first important about the shaft that it is uh, the shaft that Herodotus talked about, but no one even know about it until I excavated it, I took the water, and I found the sarcophagus. Only Zahi didn't discover it. As we have already covered, it was already considered a new discovery 
back on March 4th, 1935, when Salim Hassan first published the news. Hassan also identified the sarcophagus and even attempted to pump out the water, nearly half a century before the Hawass excavation. But what Zahi did do was link the legendary account of Herodotus to the site and rebrand it as the symbolic tomb of Osiris. The Osiris shaft was first dubbed the Tomb of Osiris by Dr. Zahi Hawass. The name is based on the second discovery from his excavation on the third level. After moving the lid of the sarcophagus, he found unusual architectural feature resembling the hieroglyphic sign Per, meaning house, cut into the ground. It is known that in the New Kingdom, the Giza Plateau was called Neb Wusa Neb Rastau, or the Lord of Osiris, Lord of Rastau, which Zahi interprets as House of Osiris, Lord of the Underground Tunnels. In his opinion, the empty sarcophagus represents the symbolic burial of the god Osiris. Dr. Hawass also mentioned that this tomb of Osiris has similarities in layout with the tomb of Osiris at Abydos. But the second important discovery that I found, this is like the Osiris. It is connected with the god Osiris. Symbolically, Osiris is buried here, who is ruling the underground tunnels at the Giza Plateau. And that is really my favorite discovery. It is the most exciting work I ever did in my life. When someone asks me, what is your favorite discovery? I say, the Osiris shaft. According to Dr. Zahi Hawass, all of the skeletal remains in the entire complex have been dated to the 26th dynasty, although they found pottery from the time of Dynasty VI. This confirms that the tomb complex has been reused. However, there is no evidence of burials from this early period. Zahi dates the second level to the Late Kingdom, 26th Dynasty site period around 500 BCE, some 2,500 years ago. The second level was dated to the 26th Dynasty based on his analysis of sarcophagi, bones, and pottery that was discovered. And on the third level, the symbolic tomb of Osiris dates to the New Kingdom, 1550 BCE, some 3,500 years ago. But new research suggests that it may be even older than that, a thousand years older. And the construction may very well predate the pyramids of Giza. Zahi found the third level filled with water, so he sent the young boy down on a rope to inspect level three in order to warrant an excavation. The artifacts retrieved by the young boy from the third level, the symbolic tomb of Osiris, date to the New Kingdom. Even though unusual pottery from the time of the 6th dynasty, Old Kingdom, that is 2345 BCE to 2181 BC, was also discovered. This confirms that the tomb complex has been reused and perhaps repurposed. However, there is no evidence of burials from the Old Kingdom period. So, the dating to the New Kingdom is based on artifacts retrieved from the burial on the assumption that the rock-cut structure was designed to be what Zahi Hawass believes is a symbolic tomb for Osiris. But do any of these artifacts really tell us when the rock was cut, or if it originally served another purpose? Could it have been reused as a tomb of Osiris long after it was cut into the rock? If it is assumed that the shaft was cut in the New Kingdom as the tomb of Osiris, this would mean the 6th dynasty Old Kingdom pottery was preserved and brought down the shaft nearly a thousand years after it was crafted. Unless it was there since the inception, meaning the rock cut structure dates not to the New Kingdom, but at least a thousand years earlier to the Old Kingdom. And after all, the Old Kingdom technique of sand hydraulics is the most logical way that they could have lowered the monolithic sarcophagi down the shaft. The concept of Osiris doesn't come into prominence until the 5th dynasty, but new research suggests that the so-called Osiris shaft was cut pre-4th dynasty, before the concept of Osiris came into vogue. And although it may have been reused in the New Kingdom as a tomb of Osiris and later reused in the late Syed period for burials, the structure was cut pre-4th dynasty as the Shetuyet of Sokar. To sufficiently explain this new theory would require much more context and time than we have allocated for this video. If you would like for me to make a separate video explaining why the Osiris shaft should be renamed the Shetuyet of Sokar, let me know in the comments down below. But for now, it's reasonable to conjecture that the so-called Osiris shaft can be dated to pre-4th dynasty, making it older than the pyramids. Here we are inside the niche, looking down shaft C, and I can see the rising water is up to the last rung of the ladder, leading into the third underground chamber. 
The descent is 12 meters. That's nearly 40 feet. Oh, I don't even think we're gonna be able to descend to the bottom. It looks like the water has risen. Clear. I'll have to go down. So as you can see, if you make out, there is, it looks like there is water at the bottom. We'll do our best to bring you all the way down and at least get a look inside if we can traverse the bottom. I wanna keep going. All right, everyone. So we are now at the very bottom, the depths of the Osiris shaft. Take a look at this. Okay, so as you can see, I'm about as far as I can go now without slipping into the water. Coming down right about here. Be cautious about halfway down, the ladder gets a little slippery. So here we have an exquisite rock cut tomb. The water level is risen, so we can't see much. This is where Boris Said would have dug out the gray granite lid. Later, Zahi Hawass replaced it back onto the sarcophagus. All right, let's first take a look at the way this stone was fashioned. Appears to be a fracture here. Using these wooden planks here just up above, his workmen would have used these to lift the lid back into place. This wooden beam running across. You can see the tool marks. The tool marks are curious because the parallel traces appear to look like a rake rather than a roller or a chisel marks. Beneath the water is an angular canal. There's a sarcophagus and a pool of water on an artificial island cut from the bedrock, forming the symbolic tomb of Osiris. You can see the rotted wood here from Zahi's workmen. Um, maybe. This was once surrounded by four columns that would have extended from the floor all the way up to the ceiling, but they were destroyed at some point after Salim Hassan's excavation. Can you see the box? And now that we have light, we can see this powdery scum on the surface of the crystal clear water. This is likely from the remnants of the destroyed columns of which now only the bases remain. Do you see it? Oh, there it is, yeah. Was crouched too low. So here's the box where I have the beam. Looks, is that the, it's like the lid, the top of it? And then there should be a cavity or an entrance, which some suspect bond that they haven't fully excavated, but it's a little hard to see it from this vantage point. In the northwest corner, there's this tunnel that Zahi believes was cut into the rock by late kingdom Egyptians. It's difficult yeah. to make out from this vantage point, but you can uh. see it here in this photo taken by Robert Temple. First Imperator of the Rosicrucian Order Amor, Kavi Spencer Lewis, published this diagram in his book, The Symbolic Prophecy of the Great Pyramid. It depicts a network of chambers and tunnels beneath the Giza Plateau extending from the Sphinx. So many people speculate that the, this tunnel leads to a vast underground network. But in 1999, Zahi Hawass sent a small boy inside to explore. He managed to only go about 16 feet before it became too narrow, even for the small boy's physical frame. What we're looking at right here is some of the rotted wood from the platform dating back to Zahi's excavation. What's up, everybody? We are in the bottom, the very bottom of the Osiris shaft. What you're looking at right now is in the very depths. You can see it's completely filled with water. I'm literally standing on the last piece of dry land next to the ladder here that rises all the way up to the top. Then in 2008, Zahi brought in a researcher with an endoscopic camera, and he was able to insert the endoscope only 32 feet into the tunnel before the mud inside it made it impossible to go any further. A month later, the team returned with two self-propelled rovers equipped with cameras, which were able to travel further into the tunnel. At 21 feet, the team discovered a branch that split off the tunnel. They were able to send the camera 34 feet into this branch before it became too narrow and muddy for the rovers to go any further. 
They also found that the main tunnel continues to a total length of about 68 feet, which then it seems to end, but it's really uncertain to determine with any clarity. So in June of 2009, Zahi brought in a Japanese team with even more advanced robot to pass the points where the earlier machines were forced to stop. In fact, in a lecture, Zahi stated that he managed to go over 150 feet into the tunnel, but did not get to the end of it. But he said that the next step would be to bring in a more advanced snake robot because of the mud. So it remains a mystery why it was carved out of the rock so deep underground and where it actually ends. And it's also interesting to note that the trajectory of the tunnel intersects with a large rectangle anomaly detected by ground right. penetrating radar that was conducted oh, by a Dr. Abbas in his survey in 1996. And that concludes our adept expedition through the Osiris shaft. And if you would like to join me in Egypt for a tour to see the Osiris shaft, you can learn more at adeptexpeditions.com. And if you feel compelled to support me, my research and the channel here, please do consider visiting my Patreon page. And if you enjoyed the video, please do give it a like. Just coming out of the Osiris shaft now, absolutely amazing. So not only did we find the bones down there, but we were able to actually identify the individual bones. With our doctor on board, we had our geologist take a look at the stone. Very productive trip inside the Osiris shaft. And if you like this, I strongly suggest you watch the next two videos I put up on the screen because they're the videos that YouTube thinks you should watch next.